Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, the podcast that explores the life-changing potential of solo travel, intentional travel, and location-independent working. Whether you're an aspiring digital nomad or simply want to boost your confidence through epic travel experiences, I'm here to motivate and inspire you to go after all your wildest dreams. I'm Jessica Grace Coleman, author, travel transformation coach, founder of Flip the Script Travel Transformation Services, and your host for the Travel Transformation Podcast. Travel changed my life. Now let's change yours. You ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, where we talk all things travel and all things transformation. My guest today is Meredith San Diego, also known as Bag Lady Meredith San Diego on social media. I met Meredith in 2018 in Thailand when we were both staying at a writer's house on the beautiful island of Koh Samui. We worked together, we hung out together, we explored the island of Koh Samui together as well as the neighbouring island of Koh Phang Yan when we dog sat for our boss and on one of the last nights we cemented our bond along with two other of our housemates, Sandy and Mel, when we went and got bamboo tattoos together, followed by dancing for hours in a Wild West style saloon on the side of the road and then trying durian fruit for the first time. An interesting night. (laughs) I had such a great time with Meredith in Thailand, and it was so nice to catch up with her now and reminisce for a bit and find out all about her travels and what she's doing now. So thank you for coming on, Meredith, and let's get straight to the interview. Hi, Meredith. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How's it going? Absolutely. Hi, hi, hi. Thanks for having me. It's good to see your face. It is. It's good to see you. It's been several years now since I've seen you. It seems ridiculous, but I think yeah. the pandemic, the timeline of the pandemic just makes everything crazy anyway, doesn't it? It does. It kind of makes everything feel like a like a lifetime ago, like pre-pandemic was like an entire lifetime ago, it feels. It really does. Definitely. Okay. So for our listeners, could you give me a bit of background about you? what you do for work and where in the world you are right now. Yes. Well, I am Meredith. I go by Meredith San Diego. Uh, it's my uh, pin name, if you will. I am basically a freelance copywriter and content creator currently in Andalusia, Spain. Um, formerly a corporate ladder climber, former beauty technician for Sephora, former uh, Peace Corps volunteer, former solo female backpacker, former lots of things, <laughs> all of which have completely constructed this very unique kind of existence that I am very, very humbled uh, to call my life. Did you say beauty technician at Sephora? Yeah, once upon a time. I did not know that. Mm. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> I love Sephora. <laughs> right. I, I also am going to ask you about the Peace call. I'm not, I'm not just going to like, <laughs> like gloss over that and mention the makeup thing. <laughs> like, I do have a question about that later. Just for the listeners, so they know that we met in Koh Samui, yes. an island in Thailand, yes. in 20, 2018, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe, I believe it was. Yeah, start of 2018 at a writer's house called The Content Castle, which sadly isn't there anymore because I thought it was such a good business model. Yeah. Um, basically, we, we wrote and edited articles in exchange for room and board. And it was this beautiful big house and they had this awesome chef called Cherry. Yeah. And it was just, it was, so, it was a very cool time. I was there for two months, I think. Were you there a bit longer? I was about three months. Yeah. I think that was the maximum. I think the maximum stay was three months. Yes, that's it. Yeah. And um, so what do you remember most about the Content Castle and what made you apply to go there? You know, Content Castle was just kind of one of those steps along my journey that I didn't see coming. It was actually recommended to me by a very dear friend who is just one of those amazing people who likes to mention your names in rooms that you're not in. Um, So Mm. she found this opportunity through, I guess, like an advertisement online and sent it to me. And she's like, you should apply for this. So I did. I actually have vivid memories of actually filling out the application and submitting everything from the floor of my friend's bedroom on the big island in Hawaii where I was crashing at the time um, because during that time I was full-time backpacking uh, so I did a lot of couch surfing a lot of staying with old Peace Corps buddies and friends and stuff like that as I kind of globetrotted strategically uh, around the world so I applied for it and got a reply back and the rest was history I was super pumped to be going to Koh Samui. Yeah, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? It was enchanting, yeah. We were in a little fishing village area and then it had a giant statue of Guan Yu, the god of war, like (laughs) next to the house. Like right next door to the house, yeah. And then they were were always doing like drumming sessions. I mean, it was like a cultural immersion 
to the max and it was fantastic. Yeah, I remember getting there at about midnight after my flight had been cancelled and I had to wait at the airport for like 12 hours and then get on a big flight and then a little flight. And I got there and I was like completely out of it and I was like lugging my case along the the road and then I saw Guan Yu, the giant statue, and it was lit up at night and I was like, oh! Yeah, (laughs) there it is. It really freaked me out. Anyway, yeah, it was a really cool time and that was was, was my first co-living experience actually and I've done a few since post-pandemic. I have to say that was the first and only um, for, for me. Not that it was a bad Did experience. It <laughs> it's just, it, I'm just saying it just happened to have been my first and only. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I really liked the um, the idea of it. And we had some random adventures when we were there. Some good times. Lasting memories. I, I mean, it's when I look back at it and I go over it, I just like I'm, I, I'm nonstop laughing and cannot <laughs> believe that we managed to do so much and see so much mm-hmm. and achieve so much, like all in such a short amount of time. And, and the amount of bonding that we were all able to do over such a short amount of time was just really, really awesome. That's the thing, isn't it? Like you can if you're staying with someone like 24 seven, you're working with them, you're socializing with them all of that then you you do bond a lot faster than you would normally in like yeah normal life <laughs> um yeah. which is what i love about it but um my favorite memory was our last night there when there was like well one of our last nights there when it was the four of us me you my friend mel and sandy and we went and got bamboo tattoos yes we, we all got a tattoo and then we went <laughs> there was like this random wild west saloon bar on the side of the road which we hadn't gone to oh that's right we stopped there on the on the way back i remember that now yeah and the guy who ran it i don't know if he was german or something he was lovely and he offered he like there's not many people there and he put us in charge of the music he like gave us his laptop and said play what you want so we played all these like 90s and noughties like (laughs) pop and r&b songs dancing along we were just (laughs) wailing to like 90s music on the radio like having this whole bar to ourselves it was so fun we were completely high on life though and that was just like amazing day yeah and our friend sandy who's a bit younger than us didn't know some of the songs and she was just sitting there like what is this (laughs) what are you (laughs) dancing to (laughs) but thankfully thankfully she was there to capture like a lot of the video and stuff because we were so like enthralled (laughs) like we wouldn't have captured anything. And then we ended the night off by going back and eating durian fruit for the first time. You guys ate it. I recorded you, you guys not? eating it because I knew better because no thank you. Oh, it's um, it's definitely a thing. Mm-hmm. And Sandy went in hard. Like she took oh, a she giant did. piece and like honked it. And I was like, oh, and she immediately regretted it. However, she, yeah. she chewed it and she swallowed it. And, and that was um, commendable. For anyone who hasn't had the pleasure, the smell of the durian fruit is a whole other level. And I went to a hotel straight after that, before I went back, and they had a sign on the hotel side, and it had said no smoking and no durians. <laughs> and you know, on on um, like domestic flights or some some international wow. flights, also you will see um, that they will say like no durian on board, like do not eat durian on a plane or anything like that. This pub, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yes, but it could, because it stinks so badly, like it literally stinks up everything. Yeah, it's a lot. I think we should mention that you've got a puppy there because I, we came on the Zoom and the first thing I saw was this cute little puppy that you've like fostered slash adopted, been abandoned. Yes. And oh my God, I can't get enough of her. She's so cute. She's, she's adorable. Look at these Aww. ears. These ears are the winner. <laughs> Look at that. That's so cute. What's her name again? Nenita. Aww. Like Nena. Nena means like little girl. So Nenita, like little, little tiny girl. So cute. So cute. So <laughs> I'm easily distracted by dogs. Yes. As anyone who knows me will know. It's okay. <laughs> she was not there with us in the saloon. But, but you know, anywho. Yeah. Beach dogs as well. It was a big, big part of our life on Coast Marie. Big thing. Yeah. We were easily distracted by beach dogs. I remember <laughs> we would take off running down the beach to record them. I also remember us getting or me getting terrified by snakes <laughs> on the side of the road and like clinging to you like some sort of, I don't know, baby marsupial to its mom. Well, I don't know if we remember this differently, <laughs> but I remember walking along the road with you a snake appearing, yeah. you jumping out of your yeah. skin, jumping behind me, yeah. and it's essentially pushing me in front of you. Oh, is that what happened? So, like, I was... <laughs> <laughs> the snake would have got me first. Well, you remember that? I remember it as if I was trying to get some sort of bear hug. Okay. Now, whether or not I'm trying to get that bear hug <laughs> from climbing behind you, I don't know, but... 
it's also quite possible I push you towards the danger. Yeah. And I think this is on our I think this is on our like second day as well. We'd like walked along to get a drink. We'd came we came back and yeah. then you were like, Oh nope. No. Snake. I have a crazy this. irrational fear of snakes, so I don't doubt that I've <laughs> completely jumped out of my skin to be fair it's not a very irrational fear like i think you know it's understandable so that's fine <laughs> yeah and i remember gecko jesus which was a gecko that frequented yeah. that lived inside the rollers the, the metal rollers in front of the main doors yeah. and i for the first few nights thought gecko jesus was a giant snake that was yeah. living in that because the, the shape of his head remember yes, you could only see his the head he yeah, and he only poked his head down, and it was super sh- like shaped like a snake's snout. And I, w- I thought it, he was was one for the longest, but he was a friendly little gecko, and he had his little wife. They were just having their life in there. It was yes, we, we yeah, we saw his little feet <sighs> one night, and we were like, oh my god, it's like a gecko. And then he's absolutely huge, wasn't he? Well, I think he was. He was huge. And then and then we saw he had a friend, and we were like, oh, it's Gecko yeah. Mary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still have my little gecko Jesus thing that we bought in the in the markets on our few last nights together. Yeah, I still have him on my work desk. Me too. Yeah, we got a little like bean, a little bean bag gecko Jesus. I think Mel's got one too. <laughs> yes, good times. I'm telling you. <laughs> right. So for people who might not know, because it's obviously not a big thing in the UK, as far as I'm aware, what is the Peace Corps? What do you actually do? What's it? What does it involve? Yeah. So the the U.S. Peace Corps is a branch of the U.S. federal government. So in in a lot of ways, it kind of operates like a military, except it's not recognized as one. And that's because there's no weaponry involved. So you don't need to have any kind of like military or combat training of any sort. You basically just come representing your own kind of background, whatever that might be. Mine was business and and volunteering and grant work. Other people's are medical. Some people's are agricultural. Um, It just kind of depends. But the Peace Corps itself covers about nine different branches. And if you have a strong background in that, in addition to a strong background in volunteering, you are welcome to apply um, for the Peace Corps. I know that it's it's a pretty, quote unquote, elite kind of uh, situation because they only accept, at the time that I applied, it was like one in four applications that they got. So um, it was a very long process. It was about a year and a half long interviewing process. You have to go through a medical clearance, um, psych clearances, all of these things before they bottle you up and ship you across the world to a very, very developing nation where there's probably no English spoken at all. And you are very much on your own to kind of do a lot of stuff. So it's like a lot of strong mental game and they need to make sure people are up for that. But um, but nonetheless, it's amazing. Peace Corps itself is only in countries that it's invited to. So what the point of it is to, to be there to help enrich the people with the knowledge that we have as Americans and the access to different opportunities for knowledge and software even um, that we have as Western countries or I keep. I want to say developed nations like that very loosely because I know that term is just blase. But anyway, and also for us as foreigners to be impacted by that foreign culture and to be able to learn and take away from it and then share that culture back in our own culture and just kind of we are the world kind of <laughs> the situation of um, by way of volunteering. So it's not something that you get paid a lot of money for. In fact, you get paid the average or just under average what the local people make on a monthly basis. So from my experience in Macedonia, I was being paid just under about 200 US dollars per month um, for being there. So it really is a volunteering kind of mentality. And you really do need to be there out of the kindness of and the willing to want to give back because you're asked a lot of yourself. It's a 24-7 gig, and that's why you get 25 paid days off um, for, for being a part of it because you literally are on yeah. all the time. So, But it was incredible, incredible experience for me. So you went to Macedonia? Yes. How long were you there for? I was there just about three years, a significant amount of time. Yeah, <laughs> gosh. Well, I mean, a blip on the you know timeline of life, but, <laughs> but yeah, significant. So what would like a normal well, a normal day, what what kind of thing were you doing day to day then as part of your volunteering? Oof. Well, I mean, I was I was working with like a local NGO, which is a non-government uh, organization. And I was my specific focus was on trying to find them grants that would help fund projects to keep the youth in my in my village because flight was a, a really big issue. My village is up was high up in the mountains, just about as east as far east as you can go before you run into Bulgaria. And then if you just go like a couple hours north, you would hit Serbia. So we were in the Osogov mountain range, and there was maybe about 2,800 people total in that village, which was 
insane enough as it is for me going from a San Diegan, which is like 4.4 million, I think, in the county um, to a village of just 2,800 folks. It was uh, insane, but awesome. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So what are they? So, so I worked with the NGO on the day to day to work with that because kids would want to leave to go to the bigger city to go to school or to find work um, to eventually leave the country for better opportunities. And so we were looking for things that would help enable like their artistic sides uh, in music and drawing and photography and these kinds of things. Also in ways to help them find enlightenment and empowerment in like the traditional art forms like weaving and salt making um, and the way that they make bread and the different kind of agricultural kind of concepts that they have to keep those alive as well because we felt that those were really important so that's that's the kind of stuff that I focused on now in Macedonia a work day is not nearly the same as what you would think a normal work day is so you know we might start out with um, you know coming into the office everyone's getting in we have our the rounds of coffee. I don't drink coffee, so I usually defaulted to making it because I got tired of explaining to people I don't drink coffee. It's just not something I like. I prefer tea. <laughs> but anyway, so we would do a round of coffee, then we crack into the day, and then maybe after a couple of hours of that, people would just stop in, and you know they were in from town, so they wanted to come say hi. You know they had a class there once or something like that. And then that turns into a whole thing where we're going downstairs to the pizza place to have lunch, which turns into lunch and drinks and business conversation, which then turns into everybody should go home a little bit early for a nap. (laughs) And then it just turns into like, nobody worry about coming back for the rest of the day. We'll pick this up tomorrow. So, you know, so the work ethic was was very different, but we still managed to get plenty of good things done and make some really good impact. So. I mean, that sounds like a pretty good work day to me, <laughs> like, especially the nap. <laughs> not going to not gonna complain. I mean, <laughs> I, I, from the very beginning of my, um, my Peace Corps experience during our, our pre-service training, they kept asking you, like, what do you feel like is going to be your biggest setback, your biggest challenge? And I always said my efficiency, because as an American born person who likes to get things done like this, <laughs> I knew going into a culture where things were much slower that that was going to kill me. And it did. It was very difficult for me to cope mm. to, you know, and to try to not be like, why don't we not do lunch for three hours today? <laughs> and then maybe focus on the eight things that we procrastinated for the court. You know what I mean? It took a yeah. lot for me to not do that, but that's not what I was there for. I was there to also integrate and, and get to know the people and their culture and the way that they work. So, so yeah. So I guess it was all a part of that and building relationships and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So when in Macedonia, you have rakia with lunch. That's just what you do. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you're from San Diego, as you mentioned. Yes. When did you start full on traveling and why did you start traveling? Because you've been traveling. I know you're sort of settled down a bit now, but when I met you, you've been on the road constantly moving for a while. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I was, I've been traveling my whole life, really, uh, living so close to, to Mexico. And my grandparents were quasi missionaries. And we spent a lot of time kind of um, donating, again, a large volunteering background. This is why I did the Peace Corps. So we spent a lot of time in Tijuana with and Ensenada with different families. So I was in and out of Mexico very, very often as a child. Um, but I think my first time overseas to Europe was with my father uh, for a school trip when I was in just middle school, like eighth grade or something like that. But I always had a passion for traveling, was always obsessed with the encyclopedia, loved Carmen San Diego, which is what was the motivation for my own travel blog name of Meredith San Diego and where in the world. But it wasn't until I joined the Peace Corps, which I use as a really big stepping stone for my travels that I really got to dive into it hardcore because as I said, we had 25 paid days off and living so close to so many different countries and I could just hop on a bus two or three hours and be in another amazing country. It was easy to travel. So in the Peace Corps alone, I saw 10 countries mostly on my own as a solo traveler. And after some ridiculous trauma and unexpected tragedies in my life that played out to the Peace Corps, I didn't want to go back to the nine to five and the hustle and bustle of the West of the American life that we that I was conditioned to to understand as successful or to rate myself as successful. So instead, I wanted to spend time healing my heart, which was in a thousand different pieces from the loss that I experienced, which for those who don't know, was my mother, who which was my adventure partner and best friend and life coach and all of those things, like someone I spoke to on a minimum of four to five times per day, took ill very suddenly and and lost her life as, as a result of, of the illness while I was in the Peace Corps. So as a result of that, home was no longer really home for me on an emotional level. So I wanted to just go. So I did. 
I just started traveling. I started planning where I wanted to go, the places I knew I always wanted to see, the places I knew my mother and I wanted to go to together. And I just went and I started traveling and writing about it and experiencing so many different challenges and empowering and enlightening moments as a solo female traveler. Sorry for the interruption, but I just have to tell you about Jessica Grace Coleman's new book, Intentional Travel Transformation. Boost your confidence, conquer your fears, and finally become the person you've always wanted to be, which is out now. This book is part memoir, part practical guide to help you transform yourself and your life through travel. Learn about Jessica's own tale of travel transformation, read unique transformation stories from the travel buddies she's met on the road, and make your way through her travel transformation framework, a method you can follow to create your very own bespoke travel transformation strategy. Your roadmap you can use to incorporate intentional travel into all your future trips. So, have you packed your bags yet? because it's time to flip the script on your life and transform through travel. Get intentional travel transformation now from Amazon or head to www.traveltransformationcoach.com forward slash books for more info. And now let's get back to the Travel Transformation Podcast. That's so awesome. And I remember like hearing about your travels when I met you and I was like so impressed, but I was also really impressed about your backpack because I cannot travel light. <laughs> and I here I am with a giant suitcase and you're tra- you've been on the road for like years and you just got your backpack and I'm like, how, how do you do? <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, B, which is what I call my backpack, is not tiny. She's like a 60 liter pack and I got really good at stuffing her really well so yeah but it was it's it's a different kind of lifestyle you know when you you don't need to buy if if, you know buying a new piece of clothing meant leaving another piece of clothing because there's no space for something else so it was Mm -hmm. very uh very different and really set me on my whole quest of minimalism and a more sustainable approach to life just in general yeah yeah and you said that san diego doesn't really feel like home as such anymore but do you ever get homesick for like the area or the states or any of your old life do you do you feel homesick at all listen let me tell you i am lamenting when i actually go home because the amount of money that i'm going to spend on the food (laughs) that i miss from my hometown alone is going to be like a small fortune (laughs) so i mean i thoroughly miss my authentic mexican food thoroughly i miss like fresh ceviche like you know taking a weekend drive to ensenada just to get like some fresh ceviche like i miss that um, and the um, the ease of, of being able to do that because of the location of which I lived in. And I, I don't really miss people so much because social media does a really great way of allowing everybody to kind of stay in touch. That's not to say that it doesn't get lonely doing what I do because you do see every, everybody else's life is going on and then you have your life and the way it's going on and the two never really kind of meet up or match and you don't really, you can't really explain, you know, to them like what your everyday non-mundane kind of life is like mm. and vice versa. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, no, I don't, I don't really get too homesick for it. It's been almost nine years now that I left San Diego. So Maybe in the first two to three years, yes. But now being so far gone from it and having lost so much from there and having no really kind of links to the city much anymore, not not really. So have you been back in, in those nine years? Yeah. Yeah, I was back just before I moved to Spain to get everything, need to relocate myself here. So that was just before the pandemic in 2019 in the fall. Yeah, I got to Spain in September of 2019. So just around then. Okay, so you're in Spain now. Yeah. Did you mean to stay in Spain or did you stay longer because of the pandemic? What what was the story? Well, I mean, I, I came to Spain because I, I was selected for um, co-teaching a, a program that they had for co-teaching English. And I knew that that would be a really great means to an end for me to have some stability and I could be still in a place and be building up my blog and doing the things I really wanted to be doing in the back end. So I knew that I was going to stay and be teaching as long as I could. I didn't know for sure if I would stay in Spain. I wanted to, but I also knew my nomadic heart. And so I didn't want to make any promises. Even now, still, as I'm going for like a more permanent residency here, uh, just for the legal purposes of everything, um, you know, I still don't know if I will stay in Spain like forever, but I will I will probably definitely invest in a property here eventually. But yeah, I'll, I'll be on the go as, as long as I as long as I can, as long as my body allows me to do it. I want to I want to. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this when you said that you would, you know, you'd been in Spain for a while. I was like, oh, I wonder if she's got itchy feet to like go somewhere else now or sometimes. 
But this place is so beautiful. And honestly, having to be grounded for the pandemic here and have the opportunity to slow travel and Lucia in the capacity that I have has just made me fall in love with mm. it like that much more. Like it's so stunning in this country and there's so much rich culture and history. And I love all of that about traveling in general. So when I have it all like in the front yard, like it's kind of hard to complain. So yeah, true. Do you have like a community there? Is there like other expats there? How have you found it sort of making friends and that kind of thing? Yeah, there's tons of expats in Spain. And now they're getting ready to launch the digital nomadic visa, which will probably mm. go live by March. So there's only going to be more of that. Personally, I'm watching it from a different set of eyes and how it's impacting the locals here because I do have a lot of local friends and, you know, watching them being priced out of their apartments or their their, uh, neighborhoods that they grew up in forever. You know, that kind of stuff is kind of hard when you are woke, you know, from that capacity. And it's also like shameful, like knowing like, shit, am I part of the problem or, or what, you know? But, um, yep, there's plenty. There's plenty of expats that are around here and there's plenty of opportunity to get to know some locals because lots of Spanish people here love being able to practice their English with native English speakers. So there's um, tons of opportunity for language exchanges. Nice. And could you already speak Spanish? Yeah, because I grew up in San Diego. I mean, but Mexican Spanish is much different than Spanish Spanish. <laughs> so, And then when you are moving around within Spain, like the dialects are different. So Andalusian dialect is way different than Canarian dialect is way different than Catalonian dialect is way different than Basque, mm-hmm. you know, so <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I went to the Basque country last year and hoping to again this year and so many like X's and T's like... <laughs> <laughs> mm, I've never been I've never been but I wanted to go so badly it just has never worked out and I have a dear friend that lives up there and speaks the language and I just I'm like kicking myself that I still haven't gotten up there oh nice yeah it was beautiful but what, yeah when I went the first half of the the time I went the weather was exactly like the weather I just left in England and I was like oh, oh. but I'm in Spain but then it got really sunny and nice yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah beautiful Okay, so you mentioned that you work as a freelance copywriter and content creator. Yes, yes. So what do you actually do and how did you get started with this? Um, That's a loaded question. (laughs) I do a lot of different things as content creators would would be able to attest to. Um, I, yeah, I do a lot of different things from blog writing to copy, web copy creating to sales marketing messages to landing pages, you know, that's what copywriters do. We do a little bit of everything uh, when it comes to that. I also do a little bit of social media management and copy creation for some clientele. What else do I do? Oh, video editing work sometimes as well, or photo editing. I also do graphic creation um, that I do on Canva because I have a really sick pro membership there and I've been, you had to utilize that platform a lot. So, ow. <laughs> Oh, so so I'm very familiar with it. <laughs> but um but yeah, so I do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I'm currently working with like a freelancing hub that kind of works as a liaison between me and the market and finds people that want to work with me. Um that's been really, really great and has given me a little bit more flexibility um, with that. But I my deal with myself when I started doing this all was that I was only going to be working part-time. And thankfully I've been able to adhere to that and that was a lot of the reason as well for wanting to stay in Spain and stay abroad because it is just much more cost effective for me to be able to do that work part-time and still be able to save money to travel. Nice so you do that and then you do the teaching is the teaching in person or online or? The teaching was in person yes but I'm no longer teaching at this time. Right okay cool. Yeah. I remember were you doing some teaching in Thailand when I was there I remember you doing some I was doing that online. Yeah, I was working with the teaching the Chinese kids online with that, which is a really great way for digital nomads if you don't know. Oh, you know what? I take that back. I forgot that China changed their rules. Oh, really? And they fired like almost all of the Western speaking things. So never mind on that. But anyway, I was working online and teaching Chinese kids online um, while living in Thailand because doing that, I think I was making like 20 or $22 an hour. So that's really good money when you're in Thailand. Yeah. Like that money goes so far. Yeah, so definitely. You remember the 7-Elevens and how much <laughs> we could just blow the, in there like in in five minutes. Uh, I remember the 7-Elevens. I remember the um, like the wine coolers that oh, we yeah. would buy. The spy wine coolers were like so cheap and really tasty and also there was a like a cafe slash bar like a couple of doors down from the house that was run by this guy from manchester of all places oh right yeah and they had your regular like beans and mash they had all your your favorites i remember that they had mince pies mince Mince pies pies in thailand and yeah he (laughs) he had 89 baht cocktails Mm -hmm. which we 
we definitely made the most of. Which is why we really found that place. The yeah. mince pie came later. That was a yeah. discovery after the fact. <laughs> we 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 went because of the price of the of the happy hour. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And he also had a cute dog called Jack Daniels. I remember. Hi, which that's is amazing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have a better memory than I do when it comes to those details. Of course, though, with the dogs, you would remember. Yeah, if it's dog related, I will remember. <laughs> Otherwise, my memory is not so great. <laughs> okay, so this is called the Travel Transformation Podcast, obviously. So I ask all my guests, I mean, we've already talked about it a bit, but how has travel transformed you personally? And how do you think it can transform people generally? Man, okay, this is not a flex. I'm just going to say, I, I personally have four different college degrees, mm-hmm. okay, And I feel like I have learned more about life and people from traveling. So, I mean, it will absolutely bring you face to face with yourself. And that's the good, bad and the ugly. (laughs) And it also just shows you like for for, for real, for solo female travelers, you know, um, uh, specifically, it will show you just how strong you are and that that is way stronger than you thought that you were. And you're far more capable of doing things than you ever thought that you were. So from that standpoint, I recommend travel for everyone, but especially for solo females, for especially for females who want to travel, who are waiting for their friends to be able to go, or they're waiting for this or whatever the excuse is. Like, I just want them to just pick up their beans and get the ganache and just go. They will thank themselves and me much later (laughs) when they, when they, when they do it, because it will change, it will change the way that they see the whole world. I mean, you can agree you've traveled on your own. Yeah, uh, it changes the way you see the world and it changes the way you see yourself and yourself in relation to the world and it's so many other things. And yeah, it, yeah. like it, it's boosted my confidence no end. And it, it, it right, yeah, it, it shows you how capable you can be. Whereas if you don't even try, then you, you're never going to know. And that's it. You know, it pushes that comfort zone like so, so far. And for me, like going through the grief of, of all of it and like unbeknownst to me then, but in hindsight now, like having a complete identity crisis, you know, not being the person who I thought that I needed to be for my family, et cetera, et cetera, during that time. But like really being able to just rebrand and rewrite myself the way that I wanted to be springboarding that off of travel and the thing that brought me life and was like the muse for my healing. You know what I mean? So it was really, really, it's really incredible what you can do with travel and how it can influence you and how you influence others just by doing it. Like it's, it's so important to visibility. Definitely. There's a huge ripple effect. Like even if you just go on a small trip and do something outside your comfort zone and someone else sees you doing that, then definitely. So we just kind of mentioned that, but in your content, you talk a lot about the power of travel as well as the power of being visible as a black solo female traveler. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me more about this? Yeah. I mean, I have come full circle with my own blackness through travel. I mean, I grew up in San Diego in the suburbs, you know, as a token. If people don't know what that means, that means like you're typically the only black person in the room or like in the classroom of students, et cetera, et cetera. So I I didn't exactly grow up in the, you know, the stereotypical African-American, black American ideal that people will have based on what media shows them in this day and age. So, you know, my parents were stable parents. They, they, you know, they had a plan. They had kids, they had kids on purpose. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I had a kind of relatively stable, you know, kind of introduction to life. And from that regard, as growing up as a token, you know, and growing up in a, in a household that was making sure that we understood what our Black history was, but it was never really around me. When I got the opportunity to travel and especially to travel to more countries that were influenced by African um, history, like it was so moving for me. And I remember being in Cuba and going down to the Calle de Jamón, I think it is called, or Calle Jamón. I might be saying it wrong. Forgive me, everyone, if I am. However, it was like the entire area that's supported by artists and also an area that supports and educates the world about the Santeria faith and how that came about and the history of it. And they have live performances of like samba and rumba and all this stuff there on certain days. And that was one of the days I happened to be there. And I tell you, I had never felt more close to Africa like in my life. And I have been on the African continent in in Egypt and Morocco, but Northern Africa is quite different than, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is. But yeah, it was just so enlightening for that. And I just felt the power from like within bubbling outward of how important it is that, that I'm doing what I'm doing and how important it is that I share this story. Because I can't tell you how many times when I talk to the people, they're like, I never see, I hardly see, or I wish I saw more of, people of color traveling like you, solo like this. And I'm like, I know tons, there's tons of us. Like, and there's a whole community, you know, and this is, this is even why it's more important. 
you know, now more than ever for that visibility to stay prevalent because people need to know that we are out there and we are traveling. And this is something that's common for us to do as well as, as brown and indigenous people of color. Yeah, it's something that's like not only possible, but like you say, like loads of them are doing it. People just might not be aware of it. Exactly. And you offer, do you offer a service for solo female travelers, um, strategic solo traveling? I do. I do consultations, strategic consultations. Why are they strategic, you say? Because travel sometimes needs to be that way, especially as a solo female. So a lot of people just don't understand that or understand how strategy can work into basic travel plans. So I like to do consultations, not a travel agent, consultations <laughs> with people about what they can expect or little tids and, and tips and hacks um, that they probably would have never even thought about or knew existed that just kind of fall out of my mouth normally because I have traveled so extensively. So, and it's also to get down to the bottom of what's deterring them really from traveling and how we can address that so they can stop having it as an excuse and just get out there and go. So I do those on a 30 minute or a 60 minute um, trial and I do free 15 minute introductory ones. So if anybody's interested in doing just a 15 minute intro to just kind of talk about what it is they might be feeling to even understand maybe they need a consultation, maybe that 15 minutes is all that they need, who knows? Um, But I'm here to talk to you and I'm here to talk travel and I'm here to motivate travel. Nice. So if anyone listening wants to do that, where do they need to go to get the consultation? You can find out all the information on my website, which is www.bagladymeredithsandiego.com. Or you can find that link, that customary link on my Instagram page, which is baglady.meredith.sandiego. Um, but otherwise, you can find me on almost all of the uh, <laughs> social media platforms that are out there, save Snapchat. But you can catch me on Twitter. You can catch me on YouTube, which I don't really post to much anymore about but i'm on there you can see great videos that i've taken of of my travels through um south america and some of my travels through thailand some of those really funny videos that we've taken like <laughs> when i was on the motorbike and passed the house and had to back the motorbike <laughs> up slowly just down the road um so there's some of those really great videos that you can catch on youtube yeah i'm also on tiktok nowadays as well facebook the list, the list. The whole list. Yeah. And we'll put those in the show notes as well. So you, you guys can easily get to those. Perfect. So before this, I asked you about your three favorite places you've traveled to, which I know is like so hard to answer, but you said Thailand, New Zealand, and Iceland. Yes. And all of those are near the top of my list as well. Do you sense a trend there? Iceland, Thailand, New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> why, why those three? What's so special about these countries? Well, First of all, I love islands, so I'll put that out there. And I know Thailand is not an island, but the most of the time that I spent in Thailand was on an island. So for yeah. me, it kind of counts. <laughs> but they were just first. Thailand is the country that I have been back to the most as a traveler who was limited when I could travel, especially when I was teaching. You know, I could only travel around holiday breaks. Um, so I purposely would be wanting to travel to a new destination instead of repeating going to other places. So. Um, I don't typically repeat destinations. However, Thailand, I have been to four different times and lived there for almost a year. So that one definitely is high on my list for that. Iceland was the trip that I gave myself as a birthday gift for my 40th birthday last year um, in January. And that was just mind blowing. It was been a destination that was on my new top three after having traveled to all the places that I have so far. Um, and that top three is Iceland, Japan, and South Africa. So I got Iceland off of the radar and I'm hoping to get myself to South Africa sometime during the summer, which would just leave Japan for me to be able to tackle uh, next. But um, New Zealand was just so full of adventure. I I can't even begin to say, and it was so enriching and full of all this beautiful nature that was untouched by man. And I just really fell in love with that entire culture and the history of the Maori people. So that's why those are my top three. Yeah, I love all of them as well. And Japan is also on my list of yeah. places I really want to go to. Do you have any countries or places still left on your travel bucket list? Oh, you've just mentioned Japan and South Africa. Is there anywhere else you'd like to go? Yeah, Japan, South Africa. I want. I really want to do just a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. That's really like what I want to put my focus on. But there's still a lot of like European countries that I feel half embarrassed having lived on the European continent for almost six years that I haven't been to, like Germany and Prague. So I would like to kind of knock some of those out as well while I'm still um, here, but I, I'm grounded until this immigration case is, is, is sorted internationally anyway, but I can still slow travel through Spain as much as I want, which is great because I love overland travel and it's a really beautiful way to see this country. So Yeah, definitely. 
Do you have a an, like a country number that you know that you've, you've been to? Yeah, I've been to 58. Wow, that's amazing. Austria last year was my 58th passport stamp in life. And I think maybe about 40, 40 of those, maybe 40 plus of those were done solo. Yeah, wow. That is an impressive count, especially the solo ones. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and um, happy birthday for this week, by the way. Thank I know you. your, your birthday is this week. Yeah. Are you doing anything special? Or? <sighs> Probably just working. Honestly, it's on a Thursday. So, I mean, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we'll see. We'll see. We'll do so. I'll, I'll, I, I take a really great, great uh, care of myself. So, I'll definitely be doing like self care things that I love doing. But as far as like big celebrations or going out and doing much of stuff, pro- probably not much. I I like having like a pamper evening or just chilling out. Yeah. The best birthday gift for me to me is like having nothing to do. So, (laughs) Mm, yeah, totally agree. (laughs) Um, Okay. So, is there anything else you want to mention or talk about before we go? Anything else you want to promote? Other than, I mean, I I would love to ask you questions too, but I imagine that's not really what this is about. However, (laughs) you can if you want. (laughs) However, I do think it's really, really awesome that you have circled back around to doing travel because I remember you discussing it as something that you wanted to do when we first met back then, Mm. something you wanted to transition into. So I just want to give you your kudos and salutes for making that happen in your own life. And I always want to support women who want to be multifaceted and go chase their dreams. So congratulations to you on that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's taken me a while <laughs> and, uh, you know, a bit of a break with the pandemic, but I got there eventually. So all that matters. That's the main thing. All that matters. And I think that's some like one of the things I like telling people as well. It's like it's never too late. Never. We're in our 30s and 40s. But, you know, even if you're in your 60s or 70s, like, you know, so many people are doing the similar lifestyle to what we're doing now. And, yes. you know, traveling or digital nomading or like van lifing or, you know, like there's so many different ways of doing it now. And I think it's never too late to start going after your dreams it's so true it's so true i think the oldest solo female traveler i've met was like 77 years old wow and i was just like man i hope that i can still do it <laughs> like at that age like how amazing is that yeah that is incredible well thank you so much for coming on the podcast today it's yeah. been so nice to see you and actually talk to you it's been so long yes thanks for having me it's so good to see you also feel free to reach out we can chat even without a podcast, if you want. Yes, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I said, I'll put all your uh, links in the show notes. So thank you very much. And until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Travel Transformation Podcast with me, Jessica Grace Coleman. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review and spread the word if you have friends or family who also want to transform through travel. For a chance of winning one of my books in ebook form, please review this podcast on Apple Podcasts and send a screenshot or just your name to info at traveltransformationcoach.com or at traveltransformationcoach on Instagram. I'll be picking a new winner each month and you can choose between any of my non-fiction titles including Write Your Life, Write Your Year and Intentional Travel Transformation. You can find out more about me at traveltransformationcoach.com where you can also get your free travel transformation guide. And until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side. Bye.